Max Kaiser, this is the Kaiser Report. Ooh, yeah. Stacey. Max, you know, there's one thing that you have been saying and been quoted on many times in all the sort of financial media relating to Bitcoin is that this black hole concept that uh, Bitcoin is a black hole sucking in all these other investments. And it is quite ironic that gold is kind of the result of those sort of uh, universal forces, universe, the forces of the universe rather than universal forces. Black holes, explosion, exploding stars, all that sort of stuff. Because your black hole that is called, that is called Bitcoin. My black hole. <laughs> My black hole. It sounds it's... like a name of a rap tune. <laughs> I was on the corner drinking some drink when my black hole said, hey, buddy, what's going on? Here's a Not chart. Not a very good rap song. <laughs> Here's a chart. I'm still flummoxed. I'm gobsmacked <laughs> by your reference to my black hole. <laughs> Here's a chart from Zero Hedge, and it's Bitcoin versus gold. Just going back to uh, yeah. you know a few months yeah. into this year. So oh, yeah. It's only 2017. Uh-huh. Uh, Bitcoin takes off, gold falls. Remember when Bitcoin hit one? This is the jaws of death. <laughs> yeah. This is called a crocodile pattern. If you get sucked into that, you get. I need this the rest of the script. Oh yeah, how much? Yes. I'll give it to you for the Bitcoin. Okay. I'm holding the script hostage. <laughs> so I'm taking over. There's going to be no turning back at this point. Me and my black hole. So remember when Bitcoin first passed the price of gold, and that had been something that we had been waiting for for eight and a half years. Everybody in the Bitcoin community has been, had been waiting for it. Will it ever hit the price of gold? Will they be one for one? And sure enough, it hit that in like September, or, or September October, probably early September, maybe it's the summer. It, everything goes by so fast. It's kind of like we're in parallel dimensions in the Bitcoin space. So it's now obviously like exploded well past that. But we now have people in the Bitcoin, in the gold space, talking about referring to the fact that gold. Are they? Is what are stealing. they saying? This is a headline from Daily Reckoning. And by the way, um, you know, you and I first, when we first met back in 2003, yeah. the Daily Reckoning was one of the only sort of online sites available at that time, one of the go-to sites. Uh -huh. This is way before Facebook and Twitter and all that sort of stuff. We went to the Daily Reckoning all the time. They talked about gold, they talked about silver. And here's a headline from the Daily Reckoning, how Bitcoin killed gold. Most seasoned traders concluded that the advent of Bitcoin futures would unravel the insane crypto rally we've witnessed over the past 12 months. Futures traders would eat the amateurs alive and slam the price lower once shorting Bitcoin became an option, they said. But so far, they've been dead wrong. So they, they, yeah. they go into how Bitcoin trading has, is still bonkers. Uh, obviously, as soon as the futures launched, it was up 26% that day. Then it was down, then it was up. So they were no less, um, they, they weren't able to do what everybody in the financial media, like CNBC, had said that the, the, um, you know, these, these, the smart money involved in futures would eat, the, eat you know, all those Bitcoin investors alive. I said that would not happen. You did say that would not happen. I uh, even though I am well experienced in all things financial and I made a whole career on Wall Street trading futures and options, I knew that this would not be the case. Anyway, so the black hole concept, though, is one where this is good money. According to Thayer's law, if you want to look at economics, it's pushing out the bad money. You know, somebody asked me this morning, what, what is Bitcoin backed by? You know, that question is always, always comes up. What's it backed by? You know, my simple answer is it's backed by all the money that's coming into it. You know, it's sucking in all the dollars, yen, drachma, you know, yuan, uh, euros. It's all being Rubble. sucked in. It's all being pulled into, and it's not going to leave. You know, once it goes into Bitcoin and crypto, you're swapping garbage money for good money. So you're not going to go back to garbage money. So it's backed by all that money. It's backed by now. When at, at that time people were saying, well, you know, gold's a, a seven trillion dollar market, 
and it's a bad comparison to just compare the price because Bitcoin at that time was only worth you know hundred billion dollars and gold is worth seven trillion dollars well since that was statement was first made the whole crypto market now is worth over half a trillion dollars it's on its way to be worth a trillion dollars it's gonna be worth seven trillion dollars it's gonna be worth more than seven trillion dollars Bitcoin itself could be worth a trillion dollars so all the fiat money in the world all the fractional reserve banking over leveraged garbage we've been warning about and in 2003, we said, yeah, gold is a place to hide from the fiat uh, apocalypse. apocalypse. But, uh, you know, then Bitcoin came around and starting in 2011, we said, you know, this is actually the way it's going to happen. This is the financial black hole that's going to suck in all the, all the fiat money. And it's happening, you know, quite rapidly. And um, so he's right uh, in, to say that the gold is the first of the major commodity slash currencies to be disrupted by Bitcoin. But after gold, we'll see um, other major fiat currencies collapse and implode. Well, remember Alan Greenspan, who was a gold bug and then became the head of the Central Bank of America. Well, he uh, had said that gold, um, the UK was stupid to give up their gold because an extremist that uh, gold is always used. Just look what happened to um, Germany during World War II. But this is something we're seeing that Bitcoin is becoming that because the gold is kind of linked to the U.S. controlled financial system. So look at what's going on with that case of Turkey versus Iran and they were using gold uh, because Iran was not allowed to use dollars. But now I've seen more and more. We've seen Venezuela announce the Petro partly if not mostly, to circumvent sanctions. Uh, uh, I saw an advisor to uh, Vladimir Putin being quoted recently that he thought Bitcoin could be a good way to circumvent sanctions as well. So the original design for Bitcoin was also in order to circumvent the financial system where so much fraud and opaque, it happens behind an opaque wall of Deriv all sorts of derivatives and, and fraud, and then they get bailed out by the central banks. Remember, th th there was actually mentioned the, the bank bailouts in the UK and the run on Northern Rock. So here, this gold guy from Daily Reckoning, and that's how you and I met over gold, talking about uh, gold uh, and Daily Reckoning. He says, Bitcoin trading is totally bonkers, and it doesn't look like it's going to calm down anytime soon. It has morphed from an underground tech geek trade to the biggest market mania we've seen in decades. Bitcoin news is pushing stock market stories below the fold. Despite the market's incredible performance this year, equities are starting to take a backseat to cryptocurrency. And then there's gold. Bitcoin is stealing gold's thunder as the holiday season approaches. Doomsday preppers used to stock up on gold and canned goods. Now they've cleaned all the gold out of their bug out bags and replaced it with Bitcoin. So then he goes on to mention that all these debates about is it a store of value or a payment system it doesn't matter if people are piling in they're they're getting rid of their gold and they're they're going long on bitcoin yeah well, that's right i mean it's uh it turned out to be a, a fantastic store of value and it's attracting trillions of dollars and uh, the price will explode upwards to 100,000 and beyond and then it'll start to level off. And there's a fantastic chart that somebody posted online about the gold versus the Reich mark, I guess was the German currency during hyperinflation Weimar Republic days. And uh, gold went to trillions of dollars uh, an ounce versus the Reich mark. Uh, uh, of Reich mark per ounce. And, and, and the same thing is happening of uh, Bitcoin versus the US dollar where you could see Bitcoin trade at a million dollars a coin, you know, it's not necessarily the price of Bitcoin is moving so much as the, the U.S. dollar is experiencing a hyperinflationary collapse, like a Weimar Republic. We're having a Weimar Republic moment for planet Earth. Well, hyperinflation is a kind of a political thing. You know, they always say, like, inflation and deflation are monetary events. Hyperinflation is a political event. People lose faith in that system. So... I know there are some who say, like, wait until you see the force of the U.S. government or the Chinese government or the Abu Dhabi government or, you know, any government's going to come in and smash your head if you don't use their currency. But if, if the people have lost faith in their political and financial system, there's nothing you can do. You can't beat them over the head enough. You cannot, the, the Gulag archipelago showed that you can't force people to believe in your your cult. <laughs> yeah, you know? Within a few years, you know, 50, 60% of the population will have a million dollars worth of crypto 
on uh, on a private key on a um, you know a, a, a trezor or some other offline you know storage device. Yeah. And how are you going to convince those people to comply with your stupid laws? I don't see how you're going to be able to do well, that. Well, it's not just that. You can, you, you can, it's not whether or not you can get them to comply with the law. Yeah, they'll pay their taxes. Yeah, they, they'll buy their Obamacare. Yeah, they'll do that. But can you get them to believe in Janet Yellen, in the next Fed chairman, in the ECB? Can you ever get them to believe that that system is sound again? Can you get them to no. say... Okay, that's going to be great. It doesn't matter. You can arrest them. You can put them in jail. You can fine them. You could do all that stuff. Whether or not they'll ever believe you, whether or not they'll be like, hey, I'm happy with the system. I'm going to go out and shop, and I'm going to think about the future, and it's all great. No, they're not going to do that. So here we've established that... You spent quite... some time in my black hole. It's affected your cognitive <laughs> abilities. Don't make the camera people laugh, okay? So, I see Frank okay. smiling. So we said it's a store of value. It's also the value of, of Bitcoin is the actual network and the ecosystem and the uh, open public ledger. Um, it's also attracted, just like early uh, Silicon Valley, what did it attract? The best, smartest, most innovative people, the, th the thinkers, the sort of people who think about putting yeah, us... No, uh, the, the answer is no, they're not going to go back. They're not going to go back to Janet Yellen. They're not going to go back to the central banks. They, they, will, they won't go back. They, they, I, the confidence in the fiat system is collapsing, and there is no turning back. This is the collapse of the nation state and the central bank and the fractional reserve fiat money system. Bitcoin is to banks what the printing press was to the Catholic Church. It collapsed it in many ways. This is the end of this era. This is the new beginning. This is about everyone having autonomy and sovereignty with their own money that is not, can't be confiscated, that never is deflationary. Value goes and, up. And like I said, the value of the network is also the fact that the smartest minds in the world are attracted to it, and they're all working on it, and they're coming up with solutions. So no matter how, many FUD, how much FUD you throw at it, you can say all the things wrong with it. As soon as you identify the things wrong with it or the flaws, that's the thing of an open source network. Is people like, oh. But the Evening Standard in the UK ran a front page story recently that said that the government needs to warn people that if they lose their cryptocurrency, there are no bailouts for them. Exactly. Exactly! We don't want bailouts! Go dig a hole in the ground, throw yourself in, blow your brains out, and cover up the hole. That's how what we think of you, Evening Standard, George Osborne, the British establishment, Lloyd's, RBS, HSBC, and Barclays. You're all freaking terrorists, and you should die. Fuck! Okay, we got to go to the break. Stay tuned. Much more coming your way. That's your time now to turn to Jim Rickards, prolific author, and he's also the chief global strategist at Meriglam. Jim, welcome back. Thank you, Max. All right, Meriglam, what is it? Uh, Meriglam is a company I started with some partners uh, about a year ago. Uh, we are specialize in predictive analytics and capital markets. Uh, it's actually the continuation of Project Prophecy, which I worked on uh, at the CIA. Project Prophecy, actually, we're, we're down here in your studio, very close to the uh, world, the uh, former site of the Twin Towers. Uh, there was insider trading in advance of the 9-11 attack. Uh, after the attack, the CIA said, well, if there's going to be another spectacular attack, uh, would there be insider trading again? Could you identify it? Could you trace it to the source, get a FISA warrant, break down the door, and stop the attack? That was Project Prophecy. I was one of the co-managers on that. And basically, we developed a predictive analytics system inside the CIA that worked extremely well. All that's happened now is I've taken that uh, technology with some partners, with some investors. We're now doing a private version of that to do predictive analytics in capital markets. Uh, how, however, we've gone well beyond what we did at the CIA. As you know, technology is advanced, science is advanced. So we've really got third wave uh, artificial intelligence on uh, some other uh, inputs to that to come up with a very robust system. Okay, now, um, remember Poindexter? Yep. What was his name, John Poindexter? Admiral John Poindexter, okay. Poindexter yeah. Yeah, he came, after 9-11, I think it was, he came up with a, a, a market. What was it called? Well, it, there was TIA, Total Information Awareness. That right. was his project. But they wanted a, they wanted a futures market, uh, basically a, a geopolitical futures market. So you could bet on whether at the time Yasser Arafat was going to be assassinated. He's died. Right, well, the whole thing was modeled on my 
Hollywood Stock Exchange. Uh, well, did you know that? It was I, based I on did, my technology. I did not know it was based on that technology. Yeah. I do know that this is, this is sort of what they call the wisdom of crowds. If you get enough people making enough bets, uh, that yeah. on, on average they'll, they'll, they'll have better prediction than you know a, an analyst sitting in a cubicle. That's now, right. now that that, the at the time when they launched it. Um, they, there was a lot of pushback because they said, hey, you know, there's a conflict here because terrorists can bet on the terror act and then they go out and commit the act and they cash in. Well, that was one of the objections, but specifically one of the contracts was uh, would, our, would Yasser Arafat be assassinated? And the pushback came from then Senator Hillary Clinton, who was a New York senator at the time, who of course was a good friend of Arafat. So there was, there was uh, that was shut down, uh, but we were, we were working, uh, that was actually DARPA, the uh, uh, defense um, project uh, research arm, but we were doing it inside the CIA. So we didn't. We sort of dodged those bullets. If you so will. it's not really, uh, you know, a prediction market as such. You're using um, predictive analytics. Right. So you're looking at the data, the, and you are using algorithms, and you are sorting through the data to try to pick up on patterns. And and this is all internal. It's not out there. People are not buying and selling prediction contracts as such. Correct. We're not running a prediction market. We're running predictive analytics. But the right. science is really moved on. There's a lot. There's less there than we see out of the wisdom of crowds. Wisdom of crowds is really good if you want to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar. The average of a thousand people with no mathematical understanding will actually be pretty good. Guess the weight of the cow like at an old English fair. That stuff works good. But the more complex the problem, the less the wisdom of crowds works. And for example, even in markets where you have a lot of participation. So let's go back to uh, February 27, 2017, earlier this year. The market was giving a 30% chance of a Fed rate, rate hike in March. The Fed actually did hike rates in March. Now, it got to 100% the day before the meeting, but there's an example where the market was way off. And that's okay. It doesn't mean markets aren't valuable, but there's a lot more to it. We use, um, uh, basically, we use a complexity theory, behavioral psychology, uh, history, and other branches of science to, to come up with our, uh, our forecasts. Okay, so you say this is an outgrowth of your work. I believe it was in death of the dollar. Uh, Where the chapter one, the death of money, chapter death, one. Death I of money, chapter this, yeah. one. Right. Okay, the nine eleven. You were um, observing as well as your uh, colleagues in the intelligence community. Right. Activity in the financial markets that telegraphed that something was coming. We were not observing it in real time. It was there. That that information was there, and I did run into people later who who saw that. The CIA was not observing that at the time. But after the fact, you can look back, and it was very obvious. The, uh, the It was done through uh, buying put options. Usually insider trading is done in the options market because there's a lot more leverage. That's the first place the SEC looks, by the way. So uh, the, the, on two trading days before 9-11, uh, buying puts in American Airlines 286 times the average daily volume. So it's like I order a Big Mac every day, and then one day I order 286 Big Macs. You know something's up. I talked to uh, John Mulhern. Uh, John, so you're saying after the, after the fact, it, you, you looked at the data, and you said, oh, my gosh. Some, some of this knowledge was circulating ahead of the event. Not just me, not just the agency, but there were academics. Uh, I talked to John Mulhern, who was the special. John Mulhern's uh, a New York Stock Exchange specialist firm made markets in America and not. He was the market maker in those two stocks. Okay, so like in the context. And he said, I've never seen more blatant insider uh, trading. When the space shuttle, space shuttle Challenger blew up, Martin right. Thiokol, the uh, contractor for the booster rocket, yep. puts, in this case, skyrocketed sure. because the thing just blew up. Here you were observing the event as if something had blown up before it blew up Correct. In, in, in the post event you're looking back yeah, and you're seeing and that right. and and so now um, markets are very sensitive to this uh, data and how much of the predictive analytics that you are incorporating in this service is taken from market data uh, well, we start with market data, and that's uh, there, there are many, many examples. By the way, you have to separate sort of predictive analytics on the one hand and like law enforcement looking for insider traders and all that. But there's insider trading all the time ahead of you know, M&A announcements. So that, that's quite common. You can always see that. You can usually see it before the fact, definitely see it after the fact. But we're, we're using that. We're using market data, but we're also using complexity theory, which says that uh, in any system, the scale of the system, scaling metrics are very important, and the density function, the interconnectedness, that's a leading indicator of a potential collapse or, you know, they... Okay, they, so what's the ratio between market data and non-market data, roughly? Um, well, it, it's hard to say. It depends, it depends on the particular note. See, we, we, we take all this. So we use behavioral psychology. So that's just, that's very well established. We all, you, heuristics, biases, you know, people would rather take... Uh, Three, you know, three dollars as a sure thing instead of three dollars twenty cents expected value. If there's a twenty percent chance of loss, you know, risk aversion, anchoring, all these behavioral biases have been very well known. You can incorporate that. We use history. A lot of the, uh, the what Wall Street does, they use correlations and regressions. 
there are a lot of limitations on that. Number one, you'll never see the weird event. You'll never see a recession. You'll never see a so-called black swan. You'll never see a catastrophic event. You'll never see that in the correlations. You'll, you always predict more of the same. You get random outcomes, which is not true. Things are path dependent, number one. Number two, the time series are often too short. I like 100, 500. I even use 1,500 year time series. Go back to the collapse of Bronze Age civilization, the collapse of the Roman Empire. You know, we're about due for another civilizational collapse. You don't predict that tomorrow morning, but those are the kind of time series that are more meaningful, in my view. So we use history. We use Bayes' rule, which is a statistical method. Um, that involves uh, just kind of starting with a hypothesis, using the best data you can. We use that in the intelligence community all the time. That was used to uh, that movie, uh, the, the Imitation Game, where uh, Alan Turing cracked the Enigma code. That was using Bayes' rule and so forth. We use all of that. But, the, but the, the thing is, you have to take all that and combine it in what we call fuzzy cognitive network, just a neural network with nodes. Each node might represent a different um, one of the disciplines I mentioned, one might be an historical note, it has some weight because something happened before. One might be a Bayesian note, it, it gains weight or loses weight based on updating. Now you have to feed those notes. To do that, we've teamed with IBM and their Idea Lab and Watson. Watson can read, you know, 200 million Twitter feeds simultaneously. I might look at 10, but, you know, 200 million. So, so the, and with plain language ability in innate languages. So now we, we've really gone way beyond. This is really third wave artificial intelligence, as I described. Okay, so um, as always in these situations, you have a problem, I guess you could call it a slippage. Um, in, for example, arbit arbitrage opportunities open up in the market, sure. and then everyone jumps in on those arbitrage opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, by a spread between T-bills in one market versus another market, mm -hmm. the ARBs come in, and it shrinks down to zero. Right. In this type of work, and I know having created the Hollywood Stock Exchange and invented the predicting prediction market industry, thank you, um, you have the problem of, and this happens in markets all the time, where you are, th the intelligence that you think you are gleaning as far as a predictive intelligence starts to get discounted by the fact that you're looking at the intelligence. Right. It's almost a Heisenberg effect of the, if you actually start to see it, it'll right. start to disappear right. type of um, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mitigate the risk of a black swan. Uh, these black swans are there because they are black swans. Do you feel comfortable that your work, to what degree is it a, let's say, a leap forward in generating, do you know yet? Do you have any track record on this yet? Where's the, where's the, what's the status of this? Well, we do, we do have a track record. First of all, we uh, predicted uh, Brexit. We said the UK would vote to leave the European Union. That was a completely out of consensus view. We predicted Trump's election. I was on television in Australia, New York, Europe, before the election saying Trump was going to win. So we actually, we predicted a Fed rate hike in last March at a time when the market was giving a 30% probability, which is true from December to late February. We were at an 80% probability now the market caught up uh, in the last two weeks is there a problem does. with uh, so yeah we have a good track a, a data apartheid right. what I mean is you've got access to the data you're making predictions you can cash in on those predictions not that that's your point we the don't, reason we you're doing it we don't trade but, we, but, we but offer that can service. be you know available to yep. hedge funds who pay big money to the intelligence committee they've got CA guys on their payroll so suddenly they access to data gives them an edge now they're profiting from this data, and the average Joe in the street is not profiting from this data. What's your but, thought about that? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right about that. And it was one of the things I said when I, when I got to the CIA and we were talking about this. this. This was all new. The CIA hadn't done this one guy they put in charge of this because he traded options like in his spare time. He was a, a math whiz and, and just traded options for his personal account. They said he was like the only guy in the agency who did that. He said, okay, you're in charge. They didn't have capital markets expertise. Capital markets were not part of the battle space prior to 9-11. They are now, but they weren't at the time. So, but I, I give the CIA a lot of credit. They know what they don't know, and they're, they're very good at outreach, and I was not the only one recruited. There were many uh, who were invited into this project, so we kind of built it from the ground up. But one of the things I said to them, I said, guys, hedge funds do this all the time. We're not trying to do anything the hedge funds don't already do. We're just doing it for different reasons. We're not trying to spot insider trading ahead of an M&A announcement. We're trying to spot insider trading ahead of a terrorist attack. But the way you do it, the math and the data inputs are the same, number one. Number two, uh, as far as data fees, they're not cheap, but you know, for $25,000, you can get real-time prices from Chicago Mercantile Exchange, New York Stock Exchange. So all that information is available. But, it's, but the algorithms but, and all the computer science and the engineers, you've you know, you got that, legions of these you've guys, got, you've got to build are, that those yourself. are expensive. They are expensive, and you have to build that yourself. Um, so there is, there is a little bit of that. But this is, 
Uh, it's not in, I mean, I'll give you an example. You can rent um, satellites for satellites in space that are private. You can rent a space, uh, you can rent uh, the use of them. Uh, there were people like following Cracker Barrel. Now, cra nobody walks to a Cracker Barrel. They're all by the highways. You drive to a Cracker Barrel. I know, yes. So they were using the satellites to spot how many cars were in the parking lot. They had some data on the average sale per car, you know, average number of people per car. And they used that to predict the earnings of Cracker Barrel. And that's that's completely legal. It, it's it's inside information, but it's, it's see, there are two, to be uh, guilty of trading inside information is a two part test. It has to be material non public information, but it also has to be acquired in breach of a fiduciary duty. If you do it yourself, you haven't breached any duty. It's your information. You can't steal from yourself. So that's completely legal insider trading. Right. On Wall Street, we used to say it's insight, not inside. Well, no one likes the word insider, but the fact is, if you if you invent it yourself, you're not stealing it, so it's legal. But yeah, do, do those funds have an edge over everyday investors? Of course they do. I mean, that's 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 just the way it is. Okay. Well, as usual, we didn't get past the first question, <laughs> but we, we're going to keep you over for another segment if that's okay. That's fine. All right. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacy Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Jim Rickers, prolific author and data guy. If you want to reach us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.